Welcome everyone to our Countdown Digital Engagement Virtual Training Series. This is part one, blogs. Um, this is a three-part series that you all have on your calendars over the next uh, roughly month or so, happening um, every other week at this time on Tuesdays. Session two will be on PowerPoint in two weeks from now, and session three will be on social media, specifically focusing on Twitter. Uh, we're really happy to, to have you all here today to talk about blogging um, a little bit in a little bit more detail um, than most of us are used to. So before we get to introductions, if you can go to the next slide, Sarah, we will start with a poll that I've just launched. You should see it pop up on your screen. Um, we just want to get a sense. These are all anonymous, by the way, all the polls we are, are using today. Um, so you just want to get a sense of what your experience with blog posts are or is um, to, to date. So I'll give you a couple, couple seconds to answer here. About 10 more seconds to vote. What is your experience with blog posts? Okay, I'll quickly share the results so you can all see them on your screen. 54% um, of you said you have written or co-written a blog post, which is awesome, but we have a, a big uh, variance across the board, which is great for this session today. Next slide. I briefly want to just introduce our speakers today. Um, we have little bios here that you can read later on, but I would just like to introduce them. Um, we'll all be speaking today, so they'll be able to further introduce themselves if they wish when, when they're speaking. We have Tori Lebrun, who is a research associate at FHI 360. We have myself, Aubrey Weber, a technical officer at FHI 360. Kelly Smith, who is a program coordinator for Countdown at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and Corey White, who is a communications manager at FHI 360. I just realized I'm not sharing my video, and I should, so I'm going to do that. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, next slide. So this is a three-part series offered by the Countdown on NTDs project that will help researchers to better understand and use online tools for communicating about your work. These are our learning objectives here for the entire series. In the past few months, we've all pushed the limits of what we're capable of uh, doing online to move our work forward when, while we can't meet and do our work in person. We've seen technical meetings, conferences, and other events move online. So this very timely series is designed to provide you with tips, and inspiration to, to improve your online communication skills related to research uptake. Next slide. Our specific learning objectives for today's blog training are listed here. Uh, it's to describe the value of blog posts for promoting your research work, recognizing the characteristics of a compelling, well-structured blog post, and learn where to focus attention in preparing your next blog post. Next slide. So I love polls. So we're gonna we're gonna ask to um, you to answer a new poll. I'm gonna launch it in a second. And here we go. The question is, how confident are you with blog writing at this moment? So 10 meaning you could write blog posts in your sleep. One being you're brand new to it, and then the variance in between. I'll give you about 30 seconds to vote here.
about 10 more seconds to vote. Great. I'll quickly share these results. We've got a nice variety of uh, how confident people feel about blog writing, which is also great. Um, our biggest percentage was smack dab in the middle at 25% saying five. We also had people um, heavily on the seven range and, and the being a novice to blog writing. So this will be especially helpful for those of you who are who are new to blog writing um, and especially new to blog writing for the countdown project. Next slide. So a little history. Uh, blogs started out as mostly personal journals and then individuals and amateur journalists started writing about news in blog posts. Now there are uh, now blogs are a major, major part of mainstream media and are used by the scientific community as well. Because so many people read blogs and they're so prevalent, it's an opportunity we can't ignore. Even mainstream media is putting read times at the top of their articles. You may have noticed this with um, right under the head, the title of a blog post or right under the author line, it will say read time two minutes or read time five minutes. Um, and this is because our attention spans have dipped in, in the modern era. But rather than be frustrated about this, we can use tools like blog posts to help communicate important information in a reader-friendly format. As we'll learn more about in this session, blogs can draw attention to an issue, a scientific finding, or an important discussion that was started um, through an in-person meeting, perhaps. Blogs can keep people engaged and bring new people into the conversation. I wanna make a quick note here before we move on about the difference between blogs and blog posts. When we say blogs, we're talking about the actual platform that blog posts, the written pieces, are published on. For example, this photo here is of the Countdown blog platform. If you were to scroll down on this page, you'd see the individual blog posts listed. So throughout, we'll refer to blogs or blog posts based on, on that, those definitions. Next slide, please. When we engage online, the success of projects we collaborate on is truly amplified. It's not about self-promotion. It's more about recognizing hard work that we all do, and it's a great way to support our colleagues as well. Funders, very importantly, also recognize the importance of telling our stories about, uh, about our work and the capacity building that takes place through research. The good coordination and collaboration of stakeholders and highlighting innovations for moving the field forward and fighting NTDs. Next slide. Just to make this a little bit more visual, if this picture here is a scientific paper, then the next slide is a blog post. So it's a li little easier to digest this way uh, for some people who are more visual learners. This is not a perfect meta metaphor, but it's a good start. People will still read peer reviewed articles and academic works. Those just take more time to process and understand. So blogs are not an alternative to other types of communication about our work, but they are a way to introduce more people to our work, including non-scientists. For example, my parents will never read a 5,000 word paper I just published, but they will likely read a thousand word blog post that discusses the highlights of that paper and a few of the key findings. Just like a coffee or tea break, blog posts help to get conversations going. Now I'll turn it over to Kelly to tell us a little bit more about what makes blog posts different from other kinds of writing, how Countdown manages the project's blog, and the types of blog posts that Countdown looks for to publish. Can go to the next slide as well. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, so firstly, let's look at what sets blogging apart from other types of writing. Uh, so usually blogs are less formally written than articles, particularly peer reviewed journal articles. They're not a form of academic writing, although they might have some content based on 
academic writing. You may find that blogs use more everyday or lay language, potentially with uh, colloquialisms uh, and rhetorical questions. Often blogs uh, use the uh, writer's view or include an opinion. Uh, an advantage of uh, blogs is that the writer can use their individual voice. There might be some personal references in there as well. Blogs can be written in either first or third person and usually blogs focus on one particular topic or event. Uh, they're generally shorter than most articles, so the aim of them is not to give a huge amount of background information or detail. The short length of a blog piece is one of its defining features. Rather than um, an intense read, they're more laid back. I always think of blogs as something a person might skim read for five to 10 minutes uh, as they drink their coffee in the morning. Later in the webinar, um, we'll speak more about writing and structuring blogs. But I think another point to make about them is that they should have short sentences and short paragraphs and should be easy to read. You won't find uh, usually as many statistics or figures in blogs. These can interrupt the piece and make it feel heavy going. Um, there's usually links within blogs though to other resources or perhaps even a, a further reading list at the end of it too. Relevant images are really important. Uh, they're used to break up the text and add interest and to make the blog more visually appealing to the person who's reading it. Uh, next slide, please. So we've talked about what sets blogs apart, but which writing rules should we still follow? As with all types of writing, blogs should have a definitive message and purpose. They can be written by one person or collaboratively with others, but it's important to consider that the more authors there are on a blog post, the longer it can take to agree on a final draft, and lengthy turnaround times could mean that your blog is less relevant when it's finally released, or potentially someone else could release a similar blog before you on the same topic. Uh, this links on to my next point, which is that there are often multiple drafts of a blog written, as with a research paper. If you're writing a blog on your own, it's always advisable to ask at least one other person to check it for readability and errors. As with other types of writing, blogs should be fact checked as inaccuracies could cause issues further down the line. And also make sure to check any links, names or other details you include before you publish. With blogs, rules still apply regarding image copyright and permissions. So make sure you have all of the relevant rights to use an image. If you want to use a stock photo, there are free image sites but you should still acknowledge the image owner or creator. In blogs, as with other types of writing, there's an introductory paragraph, which should give the reader an idea of what the blog is about within the first 20 seconds. And as with all writing, it's important to avoid repetition and unnecessary details. We want to keep it interesting. Next slide, please. So um, past blog posts from Countdown, I've given a few examples here. So over the years, there have been hundreds of blog posts by Countdown. You can check them all out on our website. Um, In-country updates might be a, a brief amount of information on the progress of a project, or it could be an update in relation to a situation in country, perhaps in regards to politics, society, environment, or healthcare. Uh, you can also blog about findings from research or practice, but of course we need to bear in mind that we shouldn't put um, certain information in there which might appear in a later paper, it's, it's got to be considered. Um, and then countdown blogs do often encompass um, cross-country collaboration between partners, but they can also be collaboration with other organisations outside of the programme. Some of our blogs are based on countdown specific events, such as the annual partners meeting. Sometimes they're based on external events uh, attended, such as conferences. Uh, they can also include events which involve dissemination too. Other areas to focus on include research methods, particularly new or innovative methods, and also capacity strengthening as well. Some blogs might be less factual and more reflective 
Next slide, please. So what makes a good topic? Uh, something that connects to a question or issue which will resonate with others. A good topic shouldn't be too complex. We've got to bear in mind the short length of the blog post. It's good if you can release a series. So a few blog posts which follow a particular theme or are interconnected in some way. Many of you will know that over the next two months, we're releasing a series of cross country blogs on the impacts of COVID-19 in partner countries. We have plans to include writers from all six countdown countries. And the three types of blogs will be overarching summary blogs focusing on particular themes. We've released the first of these yesterday. The second will be released later today and the final three through the rest of the week. Then we also have conversation blogs based on conversations between partners discussing the impacts of COVID-19 on their countries in regards to health systems, communities, research and daily life. And finally, there will be day in the life blogs where photo voice method is going to be used to show what daily life is like in lockdown for a few of our countdown researchers. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we don't have a set review process for countdown blogging. However, it does usually follow along these lines. So you'd pitch your idea with an outline and decide if you were going to work alone or with collaborators. After drafting and reviewing your blog and sharing with your team lead, if appropriate, the blog will usually be reviewed by one or, two, uh, one or more of the LSTM team who will send back any comments and suggested edits. Uh, I'll usually assist with formatting, finding images, proofreading, that type of thing. And then once a final draft is approved, I'll upload onto the Countdown website and promote on Twitter. The more people that view your work, the better, of course. So please do promote your own blogs and also promote your colleagues as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, what are the key points then that we can uh, take away from this when thinking about Countdown blogging? So they would be keeping your blog to two pages wherever possible, including at least one image, a quick turnaround with blog drafts to be able to release the blog as soon as possible, preferably within a few weeks of starting. And also thinking about your writing style. So we're not looking for an academic standard or style of writing. It's an opportunity to be a little more free than that. Thank you. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So we'll have a third poll now, launching right now. Uh, so sometimes people perceive blogs to be, and blog posts, to be less important because they don't understand the value of blog, the extent um, of how it reaches their, to the extent, to extend the reach of their work, excuse me. Um, so please vote, uh, what is your relationship with blogging? Um, there aren't a ton of answers here, so pick the one that fits best, feels best to you. And we'll give you about 30 seconds or 30 more seconds to vote here. About 10 more seconds to vote. Great, I'll quickly share the results. So we've got a lot of different relationships with blogging, which is great. Most of you said that it's complicated, which it's totally understandable um, saying you've written one or more blog posts before, but it wasn't an easy process. So hopefully uh, during this session, um, it, we will go over some of the things that might make it a little bit easier to, to digest the process of, of blog writing. So I'll pass it over to Tori now. Thanks, Aubrey. I'm just starting my video so you can see me. Okay. So now that we've had some orientation about blog posts, I want to show you how they're different from other written deliverables or product 
projects that you may have more experience working on and how they complement other research communications. Blog posts have a unique place in communications because they are a little more flexible than other written products. Uh, they can include your perspective, as Kelly said, and they help people to feel connected to your work and the people that your work affects. So this table shows a few of the written communications products that we scientists traditionally produce to support research uptake and dissemination. We have the classic peer-reviewed journal article, which is the long form of your research and results. Um, and then we have abstracts, so um, click not to the next slide, but um, there you go. Um, abstracts are much shorter than a manuscript, which can be 5,000 words or even longer for qualitative um, research. And that is really the long form and includes everything that is really important to know about your research. The abstract is the shortest um, type of communication that you'll probably write about your work. Uh, by contrast, um, and it really distills just the most essential content, but is still written primarily for a scientific audience. A brief, if you've ever written one, is uh, usually between one to four pages or two pages double-sided, and it's really um, designed to communicate the main takeaways from your work for policymakers, uh, program managers, or implementers who will be acting upon your work. So that often focuses on the results and the takeaways in um, key points or bullet points. So notice how the purpose and content of these products is different for each one. To compare and contrast, blog posts are short and concise like briefs but they're aimed at a wider audience and one research project or body of work can have several posts that are related to it. The focus of the content is typically on the text that you write and some high impact images to help tell the story. The average blog post is between one to 2000 words and it takes less than 10 minutes to read. Blog posts can be used strategically to keep stakeholders engaged or to turn attention to an issue. So blog posts may feel outside your comfort zone a little bit, but um, the best way to approach blog writing for a newbie is to jump right in. Next slide, please. These are a few um, examples of blogs that you may be interested in looking at. Um, these are blogs from the NTD community and from scientific communities. And um, man, many major scientific journals have blogs now. So there's an example on the bottom of a blog from PLOS. Um, they have one on global health called uh, Speaking of Medicine. They have this one um, specifically for the early career research community. There's um, some NTD blogs like Bug Bitten. Some countdown authors have also um, had their blogs posted on Bug Bitten, which is a Biomed Central blog. And then Core NTD has a blog. And right here in the center, I wanted to share with you that um, FHI 360 has a blog where we share um, many posts that summarize research. And Corey White, who is our guest speaker today, is the managing editor of that blog. So reading others' posts is a really great way to stay up to date with your field and to get ideas for writing. You may want to open up some of these um, blogs in your own browser and bookmark them to read for later. Next slide. Of course, here we have our countdown blog. Um, if you haven't seen Countdown's blog lately, you should definitely go and read it because there are a lot of new posts coming out. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, one came out just yesterday. Blogs are posted from the most recent one going back several years. All of Countdown's posts are shared um, and through social media and in other platforms, particularly Twitter. Um, so this really um, helps to share it more widely. And when partners and stakeholders see those tweets, they're directed right here to Countdown's blog. And then they also um, have the opportunity, of course, to comment and share with their followers. Um, 
and we'll talk more about that, that throughout this digital engagement series. Next slide, please. So we're gonna do a little interactive activity here or try it out. Um, if you haven't used annotation on Zoom before, this is kind of how you do it. So at the top of your screen, you should be able to see a view options um, right next to a green bar that says you are viewing Sarah Dixon's screen. If you click on the view options, um, there is a button that says annotate. And then as you see on this slide, you can choose stamps or text and you can actually write on the screen. So we're gonna try this out. If you cannot, um, if it's a little too difficult right now, you can put your responses in the chat box, but we would like to, you to try to practice this. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Sarah, Uh, our annotation question is what makes an outstanding blog post? So I really want you to think about like a one or two word descriptor for this. Um, and again, to annotate on this white slide, uh, go to view options at the top of your screen, click annotate, and then go to the text button. And then you should be able to hover right over and write, yep, we got one. That's great. Um, and again, if if you can't figure it out right now, that's totally fine. We know we sprung this on you. Um, and this is an, a relatively new feature that people are getting used to on Zoom. Um, so you feel free if you can't write um, to put it in the chat box. Short, captivating, engaging, personal, easy to read. Yes, these are all great. Thought provoking, current, novel, interesting topic. I love all these words. Concise, yes. Wonderful. Great. Great, thank you. A lot of you figured that out so quickly. That's great. <laughs> we'll give it a couple more seconds to, to write on the screen. Timely topic, accessible, flexible, engaging, a lot of engaging and captivating. Excellent, you guys are getting it. <laughs> Perfect, okay, with that, we will pass it back to Tori to continue. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, those were some awesome answers. And you hit on some of these elements um, that a great blog post has, particularly this element of it being very interesting and sort of quick moving um, that keeps people's attention and um, being timely. So uh, I wanna break it down a little further and talk about the components that you will need in your blog post. And this is going to help us to write structured blog posts that will be really attention um, getting and really keep the audience engaged. So you need to start um, by having a compelling title that pulls people in and grabs their interest. The beginning of your post um, should make you keep reading with enough information to set the stage, but still quickly get to the main points. Um, sometimes we use the term hook um, and that is just the idea of um, starting with something that really grabs attention, that's captivating. Every blog should have photos, as we've mentioned a couple of times. Um, and then your main body of your blog is the, the content where you really explain your points um, and then conclude very briefly um, by encouraging people to, to share and um, interact with, with your thoughts and your, your posts that you've shared. So if you click a couple of times, Sarah, you'll see the, the three primary components that you will be writing are these ones that are highlighted, a brief introduction, your body content, and the conclusion. 
Next slide. I want to talk a little about what makes a great title for a blog post. Um, there isn't a really specific blog title format, but there are a few best practices that will help you to come up with a title that grabs attention um, and is still informative. It doesn't have to tell the reader everything about what's in the post, but the title should reflect the main content and it should contain key terms that help to describe the subject and will help people to search um, and find your blog post. If you have a provocative thesis or if you're raising an interesting question, you can make that into a title. And here are three examples from Countdown's blog of previous blog posts. The first one is a title that connects to a larger health issue, universal health coverage. Um, the second one is an example of a title that joins in the conversation about an advocacy day, World NTD Day. Those types of posts are usually planned ahead to coincide with that day, but because blog posts can be published relatively quickly, it's also possible to write a post as something is happening, as an issue is unfolding. Um, if you're attending a conference or right now, as with COVID-19, we're writing a series on that. And the last example here is an example of a title that uses a thought-provoking question to frame the issue. Next, thanks. I want to encourage you if this seems a little intimidating, um, the best place to start is by getting something down on the page. If you click there, you'll see that. Um, you don't always have to write the first sentence first. Sometimes it is best to just put down ideas as bullet points or just use free association and write whatever comes to your mind about the topic. Um, the best thing to do is just get started and share your ideas with others for feedback. Um, a little bit of writing advice is um, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged if it takes you longer at first. Some people can churn out blog posts and have them almost ready to go in a couple of hours, but others may take weeks. And if you're collaborating um, with others, you may take time to go back and forth with them. Expect iterations and um, a lot of edits at first. It's not a bad thing if your first draft is really rough. Um, it, it will get better and um, when you share with others, you'll really, that will really help to refine your, your writing and you'll find your voice. Next slide. So this is just an example of the power of imagery. Um, of course, we all know that um, images can really help to keep people engaged. This is a blog post that I recently published about a family planning research project, and the title is a question. Um, it's, a, it's a good title, but um, if you go to the next slide, when you see it with an image, it just um, really draws you in so much more and makes you want to read that, that post. So an image is still worth a thousand words, as according to the old saying. Next slide. Um, when we talk about content, um, the main point that I think to keep in mind when you're writing blog posts, especially if you're used to writing more academic types of work, is to try and explain everything for a lay audience so that anybody reading your post will be able to understand it. Um, eliminate any jargon and if you have acronyms that you use, spell them out and explain them. Um, the link here is to a blog on the Early Career Researcher Community blog, and it's great for further reading if you want to um, understand more about the importance of that and, and how to really write in simple and clear terms um, so anyone can understand. Next. So now I'm going to turn us over to Corey White to share some of these top um, keys to success and pitfalls to avoid. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Corey. 
I am a communications manager at FHI 360, and I'm also the managing editor of the RNE Search for Evidence blog that uh, Tori had showed you earlier on an, uh, on an earlier slide. Uh, let me f first start by saying uh, many of the keys to success that I'm going to chat about here, uh, Aubrey, Tori, or Kelly have already outlined in this presentation. I, I don't know that I could emphasize any stronger that the presentation that you've just watched over the last 40 minutes is pretty superb. And I hope that you go back and look at these lessons uh, and listen to the recording. Um, everything that you need is truly here. Uh, so, and, I, and I'm really excited to see what the, uh, the countdown, the, the new series is going to uh, publish. So, in the time that I've managed the Arnie Search for Evidence blog, we've published about 160 different posts over the last three years. So there are some tips and pitfalls that I've compiled that I think would be useful for you uh, to take to heart. So I'm going to, to run through them now. Uh, the first and in my mind most important is to select a topic that you're passionate about. Uh, we always tell an author that writing a post should be fun. And if it's not fun, then you maybe are doing something wrong and should start over. I, I have myself have been in that situation and have had to start over. If it's, if it's too hard, uh, then, then maybe think twice about what you're intending to do. When you're passionate about it, if it's something that really interests you, it should be it should flow fairly naturally from you. And that's how I would encourage you to get it down on the paper first. Uh, you, you can refine it yourself. The editor will also help you refine it as well. So don't overthink it too much would be my, um, my first tip for you. Uh, second, titles and introductions matter. That's simply something that's reinfor reinforcing what you've already heard uh, this morning. I would say your Introduction paragraph should be one paragraph maximum, and it should end with what I call a signposting statement or a thesis statement. Sometimes that sentence reads something to the effect of, in this blog post, I'm going to X, Y, and Z, or X and Y. Uh, and your title really does matter, as you just heard uh, Tori said, uh, for a variety of reasons, but to peak interest uh, is top of the list. Uh, I would also encourage you to write as you speak. Uh, Kelly talked about that earlier in the presentation. I would encourage you to write in the first person. Use I. If it's a research team, you can say we, like we did this as a, as a team. And I would encourage you to use active voice. Uh, also, keep it light. Uh, don't go overboard with either flowery writing or writing that might be too academic. Just keep it light. Keep it fun. Uh, and it will also be more fun for for you to to produce. Uh, the fourth item before I before I go into that, I I know from the poll at the beginning that each of us has a different level of experience with blog post writing. Probably also, I, I'm I'm assuming with the process. So search engine optimization matters, and it matters a lot. Uh, you can think of this from uh, from a couple perspectives. One as a writer, but also if you are the one putting it onto a website, you can also help the, the author think of uh, how to optimize uh, the post for search engines. And, and what I mean by that is, so Google and other search engines pull keywords to produce search results. Uh, those keywords are pulling from the URL that is often defined by your title. It's also pulling keywords from headers that are existing within your post. All of that is helping a search engine define its results. Uh, that is particularly important because blog posts are somewhat ephemeral, meaning temporary content. Tweets are a great example of ephemeral content. A blog post is not as temporary as a tweet, but once something is published a year or two later, it's, it's probably going to be difficult to find if it's not been um, structured in a way that allows a search engine to pull out content. Uh, 
in, a, in an efficient way. So again, that maybe is a, a tip directed more for your website manager, but also something to keep in mind as a writer. I mean, and it also makes for a natural flow for a reader. I mean, if the headings help keep a flow and make sense, I mean, that's also more engaging to read. Uh, and finally, have a dissemination plan. Countdown is also going to help you with that, but even if you're writing something for a personal blog, uh, if you're going to go to all the work to write and publish a post, make sure that you're not just shouting into the wind, make sure that people have the opportunity to, to read it. And you can do that by sharing it on your social media. LinkedIn is a, a great way to do that. Just share it as a link and publish. Uh, there, you can also self-publish on on LinkedIn, but that's sort of a different story. Uh, but it's important once you've written it, make sure that folks have the opportunity to read it. So disseminate it. You can uh, publish on social media. You can email contacts that that are within your network uh, uh, to circulate it. The, in the next slide, I'm going to cover some pitfalls that I would encourage you uh, to avoid. Uh, in the 150 posts or so that I've helped to edit, um, I, I've seen a lot of things uh, that authors have done correctly, but also a lot of things that, um, that you can avoid. Um, first, I would say don't try to talk about everything in one post. That's, again, reinforcing what you've heard here this morning. Select one topic and a topic that is of interest to you and focus on that. Uh, the great thing about a blog post is you shouldn't be talking about everything. And it, it gives you the opportunity to link to your scientific paper, for example. If you're just highlighting a few points from the paper, ultimately what you want to do is direct traffic to the paper. So you link to that, um, give a, a, a few um, inviting highlights from your personal perspective and link them onto the paper and they can read your full paper if they want more details. That's also going to help you reach beyond your, um, your sort of immediate expertise. If you publish a paper on NTDs or contraception, something that's really specific, there will be aspects of your paper that are applicable to people outside your field. So try to pick something, some highlights that are of interest sort of generally, and if they wanna know more about your, uh, uh, the specifics, they can click onward and read it. Uh, secondly, don't bury your point. Uh, that sort of goes back to the title and introductions are important. Your first paragraph should tell readers what they are getting and what to expect in the rest of the post. Sometimes readers also simply scan. If they have to scan three or four paragraphs to even get to what you're about to talk about, you've probably lost them. So don't bury your point. I would say avoid portraying yourself as the expert without giving context. And a couple of things come to mind uh, when I say that. Um, I would avoid saying things like, we all know that dot 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 if we all know that give some evidence to prove what you mean by that I don't assume that everyone knows that because probably 90 percent of the time they don't I, I would also say if you're presenting yourself as an expert um, let's say survey design for example or some sort of program implementation give the context of why the reader should think of you as an expert. If you're talking about survey design, explain that you've uh, designed 10 surveys over the last 10 years, sort of set yourself up. That also positions you as a thought leader, but also um, shows the reader that they should continue reading and, and trust your opinion or trust your, uh, um, uh, trust your story. Don't forget hyperlinked. Uh, uh, references. Hyperlinks are your friend in a blog post. Uh, as I've said and what others have said this morning, don't try to say everything in the post. Use hyperlinks to link them out. Uh, link to your own resources, links, link to colleague, resources from colleagues, other papers that are uh, uh, supporting your, your narrative and, and, and provide those references. Um, and lastly, don't 
plagiarize others and don't self don't self plagiarize either. Um, so always cite your sources. Uh, uh, nothing will destroy your reputation faster than a colleague or employer uh, discovering that you have plagiarized. Um, that's a given, but just make sure that you don't do that. What I mean by self plagiarize is if you've written a scientific, if you've published a paper in a journal, don't copy and paste your narrative from the paper into a post. First of all, that's just not smart. Second of all, the journal technically owns your words now. So that is their copyright. And it's just, it's a really bad look. If someone's reading your, your blog post and then they go to your paper and it's the same language, um, self plagiarism is in my mind, just as bad as normal plagiarism. I mean, your blog post is an opportunity to, to have a lighter, um, a lighter touch conversation and the paper, if, if we're using a, a journal paper example, is the opportunity to, to have more, have a more detailed conversation. That's what I got. Thanks, Corey. Um, that was great and very helpful. So we have a little bit of time for some questions or discussion. Um, so now's, the oppor now's your opportunity to unmute. If you'd like to ask your question that way, you can also put it in the chat box and we're, the four of us are here to answer your questions. We'll probably have this period last until about, if, if we have a lot of questions, last until about uh, five minutes till the hour um, because we have a few wrap up slides to share with you and resources. I find that most of my questions uh, come to me as I'm writing blog posts, but um, maybe this is a good sign that we covered a lot. <laughs> Are there ever too many questions and too many pictures in a blog post? Corey, would you like to answer that one? I would say yes. Uh, don't overload it. I, Minimally, you need one picture, as um, I think it was Aubrey that, or, or Tori that had shared earlier. I mean, that's an, an invitation um, that provides word, that what, what words cannot, what the written word cannot. I, I think also figures are important to include, but I would say probably no more than two or three figures, probably two figures if you're going for a two page post and, and one primary picture. Similarly on rhetorical questions, I would limit your rhetorical questions in a post to maybe, I, we say one, but I wouldn't have more than two. If, you, if you're posing questions in a, in a post, uh, that's a, a little odd, you should, to me a post is answering questions. Uh, so I would also limit rhetorical questions. That's not what you asked, but it came to mind. Thanks, Corey. It's a good idea to write a blog post and remain unanimous. You don't want to show maybe your identity as a writer. It's a good idea. That's another good question. I would say, um, in, in this case, no, when you're writing about your work, you wouldn't want to be anonymous um, because a blog post is really an opportunity for you to increase your reputation and, as a researcher um, and to interact with others in your field um, to share what you're doing. And there's, there really shouldn't be anything in a post that you would write for a countdown or for a research project that you, that you wouldn't want your name attached to. Uh, sorry, just to join in with that one as well, probably the exception might be some of the blogs that we are doing for the cross country blog series at the moment. I mean, usually it's not a general thing that we would do on countdown to have them as anonymous. Um, however, 
there is an option at the moment if um, because some of the things that people might be writing about might be quite sensitive, um, talking about the impacts of COVID-19 or um, indeed some people are writing the uh, daily life uh, blogs, um, the day in the life blogs, which are mostly photo voice. So those will actually use a lot of images, but they may not be images of the person themselves. So it, it doesn't necessarily, it, if a person would would like to share things but wouldn't like their name attached for whatever reason then that is something that we can consider but it, it's more in post which which people are sharing things that are more personal and how do we know if our block is complex what was that sorry if the blog is complex i think oh. complex yeah Oh, I'm not sure about that one. Does anyone have yeah, any? I can add, um, I think that one of the great ways to sort of test out if your blog post is too complex would be to ask a friend who's not in your field to read your post and then they, they'll be able to tell you pretty quickly if there are things they find confusing or um, terms that they just don't understand. So that's one way um, to try and um, answer that question, is my post too complex? Um, you can also just do a quick check looking through to see if there are um, terms that might need to be defined. Um, but I, I think really sharing it is, is probably the easiest way. Great. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat box. Um, Victoria asked, can images, photos, and graphics also be hyperlinked in a blog post? Um, I can take that one. Typically, uh, I typically we don't see hyperlinked photos or images, but credit is necessary. So typically there'll be a little section right below. And sometimes if there's multiple images from multiple sources at the, the top or the bottom of the blog post, depending on the, the blog platform and how they structure their posts, um, so you'd have photo credit and, and list the source that way. Um, Kirsten also asked, how many iterations of a draft post do you all think is typical? Um, Kelly, could you answer this from the countdown perspective? Yeah, sure. I mean, needless to say, it does vary from post to post. I've never seen really a, a blog drafted that has no edits made to it that's extremely rare um, so I would say probably somewhere between two and five um, is is usual maybe between three and five uh, so it may go to a few different people um, before we reach a final draft. I can confirm from our perspective on our blog that is what we would say too. Anything more than five probably indicates that there's a, a larger challenge with the the narrative um, so to define excellent julie asked a great question how do you balance personal opinions and views on issues that may be challenged by others do you want to have that I mean, I can say something. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, on on our blog, um, a, a post that would be more that would be more of a personal narrative, we, it would simply just need to be backed up with with evidence. I would, our, our blog is a, a little bit different because it is a research and evaluation blog, so it is it has clear objectives um but but if you if i take that out of my mind if you if you're going to be writing a post um that you suspect would be challenged prepare yourself for that i mean you're writing it presumably because that opinion and uh, matters to you um so i mean so you should just expect that it would be challenged think of what those challenges might be as you're writing it and perhaps try to address them and, and back them up with with evidence particularly peer-reviewed evidence that's harder for folks to argue with 
Great, thanks, Corey. I think that's all of the questions. Um, oh, we got one more and then we'll move on to the final slides. Will you advise that a published blog be part of one's resume or CV? Um, I, can, I can take this. Short answer is yes. Um, definitely your, your CV. I, I've written myself probably about 30 blogs now in my, in my career, um, and I have them all listed and linked on, um, on like my extended CV. That, that's a lot of blog posts to list on like a resume, um, but typically I, I think it's important to, to show the breadth of, of your work, just, just as you would have a published um, paper or scientific, uh, in a scientific journal um, on your CV. Great, so if we could go to the next slide. Thank you all, those were wonderful questions and I'm happy that we had time to answer them. So we have uh, just two additional resources here to look at in your, if you're interested in your own time, um, you, you'll be able to access these links um, when we send you the, the PowerPoint um, and the recording after this session later this week. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, my apologies, Corey, for leaving you out, but I will add you before the, sli the final slide deck goes to everyone. Um, this is no worries. This, this is your show. I mean, this <laughs> is, I mean, so, so don't, I don't have to be here. <laughs> okay. Um, so th this is how you can contact us. We have our email addresses here and then below that is our Twitter handle. So feel free to follow us. Uh, and um, we're happy to, to ask, to help you out with more questions and as you are blog writing for Countdown and other projects. Go to the next slide. So we have one final survey. Um, when you're done with the survey, I want you to stick around because I do have to send you a link in the chat, but we're going to retake the confidence question um, now that you've gotten a, a lot more information about blog writing and blogs in general. Um, I would like to see you vote again on how confident you feel with blog writing. There's no right or wrong answer here. Um, but yeah. You have about 15 more seconds to vote. Okay, I will quickly share the results. So it looks like we're a little bit more across the board, but um, the majority are are higher up at eight. So this is very this is very nice to see. Um, again, it doesn't matter where you where you fall here. Uh, confidence is built as you continue to blog, to write blogs or write blog posts for blogs. Um, it really gets, the process at least, gets easier with time, just like anything with muscle memory. Um, it gets easier with the amount of times you, you practice blog writing. So if we can go to the final slide, I just wanna let you know that I am sending a link right now in the chat box. This is a survey. Um, it's six very quick questions. It should take you no more than two minutes to complete. We'd love it if you would complete it um, immediately following this session, um, but we will send it out in the email as well. Uh, a recording, like we've said, a recording of today's session along with a copy of the slide deck will be shared later this week. Um, we will need a few days just to finalize the recording and everything, so be on the lookout for that. And we are hoping that you will all join us for part two and part three. Um, PowerPoint will be on June 23rd, same time in the week, and social media, specifically Twitter, will be on July 7th, same time of week. So thank you all for joining and for engaging and participating and your great questions. We're so happy that we can, we, we could kick off this, this series today with, 
with blogs. Have a great day.